This program is brought to you by Emory University. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to Friday Morning Fellows Conference. Our speaker this morning, as you can see on your screen, is Dr. Chris Asuzu. For those of you that haven't met Chris yet, he's one of our first year clinical fellows. He's a native of South Carolina, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and uh, did medical school at Medical University of South Carolina, did a residency at Duke, and is going to talk to us today about infective endocarditis, an oldie but a goodie, an important, an important topic, uh, obviously. So uh, go ahead, take it from there, Chris. All right. Thank you uh, uh, for the welcome, Dr. Uh... Dr. Williams. Again, I'm Chris Asuzu, and as you can see, we'll talk about a little bit uh, effective endocarditis today. Hopefully, you all can have some, some good takeaway uh, messages from this talk. All right, so I have, well, let me see here, I have no disclosures. Um, so learning objectives that we'll, um, we'll touch on today, we'll, we'll, first, we'll just review the epidemiology, the pathophysiology, and clinical manifestations of infective endocarditis. Uh, then we'll discuss the role of surgical intervention um, in the management of patients with infectious endocarditis. And the, then we'll explore the, uh, the, the incidence of infective endocarditis following prosthetic valve re replacement, particularly looking at patients uh, with uh, uh, aortic valve replacement, SAVR and TAVR. And then lastly, we'll briefly review the guidelines uh, for the prevention of, of infective endocarditis. So as all good fellows talks start, uh, we'll, we'll start with the case. Uh, so we, this is a gentleman that I actually met this year in my continuity clinic at Grady, and I didn't directly care for him in the hospital, but I've been following him in his case because I saw that he was admitted a few months ago. Uh, but this is a 57-year-old uh, gentleman. He uh, has a history significant for heart failure or with reduced EF. It's about 25 to 30% prior to him coming to the hospital. And we also had this atrial tachycardia for which he underwent an ablation uh, a few months prior to his admission. Um, uncontrolled uh, diabetes on insulin, and that's what's complicated by uh, a, a diabetic neuropathy. He also has really bilateral Charcot foot deformities, um, and he's had cr chronic osteomyelitis of his left foot and has had prior admissions for MSSA bacteremia. Um, so he actually presented to Grady Hospital with a uh, just a several day history of, of anorexia, uh, uh, excessive thirst, urination, epigastric discomfort, and some subjective fevers. Um, so his vitals on admission, remarkably, he was afebrile. Um, he was uh, tachycardic with a heart rate of 187. Um, blood pressure was remarkably stable at 127 over 79. He was tachypnic with a respiratory rate of 33, but sat in well in room air at 95%. Um, his exam, so, you know, his exam on the admission, he notably he was in mild, you know, mild distress. Uh, from a volume standpoint, he had flat neck veins, didn't necessarily look volume over overloaded. If anything, he actually appeared to be volume down. Um, notably, he was, had an irregularly irregular rhythm uh, with, at, this, at that time, no appreciable murmurs, rubs, or gallops. Um, he was notably to keep it with the increased work of breathing, and, and the admission note noted that he had some solved by basilar crackles on this posterior lung fields. His abdomen, um, with the exception of, uh, you know, of some mild epigastric tenderness, was other, otherwise benign. Um, his extremities, uh, just remarkable, really just for this non-healing ulcer on the dorsum of his foot, but no significant rashes um, um, and no significant purulent drainage from that ulcer. His extremities were kind of cool, which is, I believe was a chronic thing for him, uh, and he is neurologically intact. Um, his labs were notable for hyperglycemia, had a, a, a high, really high glucose, um, it had a leukocytosis with evidence of a left shift, and a metabolic uh, acidosis with a pH of 7.2 and a PCO2 of 26, and a lactate notably at 6.6. Of course, he came into the ED, so they checked troponins, and they were notably elevated at uh, 8,100 and eventually downtrended uh, throughout his admission. He had a BMP of 483. This was his EKG uh, on, on, on admission. He had a uh, new onset atrial fibrillation. Obviously he was going pretty fast here um, at around 170, 180s. So he was admitted to the ICU and I know you're like thinking like, why am I presenting a case of DKA? But he was admitted to the ICU for a case for, for DKA. And the team actually got a trans thoracic echo um, uh, for the workup for this new onset atrial fibrillation and his elevated troponin. Um, what, it, what they found was that he had a stably reduced uh, EF, about 25-30%, uh, no significant focal or new, new focal wall motion abnormalities, and he had a small pericardial effusion. 
Otherwise, his valves looked okay. I believe he had maybe some traced mild MR um, and some TR, but really nothing was remarkable and from a valvular standpoint. However, the next day, his blood cultures grew two, uh, two out of two, uh, grew, uh, were positive uh, for MSSA. And at that time, the source was really unclear. So, and excuse me, I was unable to kind of get these uh, images off of the uh, imaging software, but I was able to take still images. And what we have here on the uh, right were his TEE images. Of course, when they, the team found out that he had MSSA growing in his blood, they requested the TEE. And what we saw on the TEE here to the right, um, uh, you can see basically this is a view of the uh, left atrium, left ventricle, and here the, here's the mitral valve. On the atrial surface of the mitral, of the posterior mitral leaflet, uh, you see this, uh, uh, this moderate size vegetation, I believe it was like five by 10 millimeters or so. Um, and this was not noted on the surface echo. Um, they also saw in the uh, right atrium, this, um, this, this mass here as well, and it was unclear if it was associated with the tricuspid valve or not. Um, but given the, uh, his, his history and the vegetation seen on the left, there was, you know, this is likely a vegetation um, versus some thrombus. Um, so clinically, he was uh, uh, obviously fit the, the diagnosis, the definite diagnosis for endocarditis, um, which, uh, you know, prompted my fellow's discussion today. Uh, so we'll first, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll just review the epidemiology and just the pathophysiology of infective endocarditis. So this is not, obviously this is not a novel uh, disease process. This has actually been around since the, you know, the mid 1600s. Um, and it, was really, it wasn't really until 1885 when Sir William Osner uh, 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 participated in the Augustonian lectures at the College of Physicians in London. And he discussed basically the, uh, uh, endocarditis and it really served as the catalyst for the study of the systemic uh, uh, process for, endo for endocarditis. Um, obviously, a lot has changed um, since then. Um, you know, endocarditis is a disease of the endocardial surface of the heart. Um, and as William Osler or, or knew it, uh, it was a deserved, uh, it was a disease that affected really just the native uh, cardiac valves. But as, as, as we advanced in kind of our medical therapies, and now the definition includes, a, you know, a, a disease of not only the native uh, valves, but prosthetic valves or indwelling cardiac devices. Um, so even though we're always searching for, I feel like we're always searching for endocarditis, uh, particularly at Grady, uh, the instance is actually, it's, it's quite rare. Um, there's two to 10, it's actually, the instance is about two to 10 cases per 100,000 persons annually. And here in the U.S., that equates to about 40 to 50,000 new cases each year. And if you put that in perspective from a, from a hospital call standpoint, it's about $120,000 uh, per patient. Um, so although rare is a pretty deadly condition, it's associated with high morbidity and mortality rates. Um, that they believe the associated mortality is approximately 10 to 30 percent. And this is really going to depend on the pathogen that's uh, uh, causing the infection, where the infection is, any underlying medical comorbidities that, that the patient may have had prior to or may have developed in the, during the course of the infection. So this is just a, uh, this was a, uh, a, a Jack article from 2012. Um, and so basically this, this study was, wanted to observe basically the trends in, in endocarditis after the change in uh, prophylaxis guidelines, which we'll briefly talk about at the end of the talk, okay? And that, and that happened in 2007. So they wanted to see, okay, well, what, what, what were the incidents of, of, of infectious endocarditis, you know, after that and before that? And what we saw, like, really over a 10-year span was that there was a gradual and steady increase in the incidence. However, the rate of that, uh, and, uh, of that increase was essentially no different from, you know, before the change in prophylaxis guidelines and after. So... Another, another point to kind of understand is that the demography or really the demographics were really gradually changing or, uh, for, for, for who is, who's getting this disease. So previously, you know, in, in the pre-antibiotic era um, or early antibiotic era, we, we, we typically thought of this as a disease that affected the young, middle-aged patients with rheumatic heart disease. However, uh, over the last few decades, we've seen like a significant shift in the demographics. And now we're seeing you know, older patients are really the ones that are really being, uh, you know, commonly affected by um, uh, endocarditis. And the factors contributing to that would be, again, the general age of the population has increased. 
And, and that's just because we're doing more things to patients to keep them alive now, which is a good or bad thing, depending on how you look at it. There's a shift in cardiac risk factors, um, namely, uh, particularly here in the U.S. Uh, with the advent of antibiotics, we're not seeing much rheumatic heart disease here in the U.S., although uh, it is still a major cause of endo or risk factor for endocarditis in, in developing countries. Now we're seeing, you know, again, older patients who have degenerative valves that may get prosthetic valve uh, or some you know, structural cardiac treatments. And that sort of certainly increases their, their risk factor profile for developing at least prostatic valve endocarditis. Again, we've had obviously over the last few decades, the introduction of really many novel um, um, uh, therapeutic modalities in, in cardiology. We have these implantable devi cardiac devices, bioprosthetic bio and mechanical valves. Um, and you know dialysis shunts, indwelling lines, et cetera. And then there's also this new entity, relatively new entity of, uh, of healthcare associated infective endocarditis that we've also been seeing over the last couple of decades. And it really accounts for about greater than 25% of the cases annually. And this is kind of like a, you know, the reason why we're kind of seeing this is a culmination of all these other reasons. Again, the general age of the population is increasing. We're doing a lot more things to patients um, and they're being exposed to healthcare more and they're at risk for these healthcare associated infections particularly with Pseudomonas uh, and uh, uh, Staph aureus. So, you know, as far as the microbiology goes, uh, generally uh, roughly 80% of the infections uh, 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 or microorganisms that cause uh, uh, endocard infective endocarditis will, are gonna be Staph species and Streptococcal species, okay? Um, we've seen a significant trend, uh, you know, basically with staphylococcal species or staphylococcal aureus species, or MSSA, uh, MRSA, basically increasing in frequency over the last few decades. And we'll talk about that in other slides. With strep beer then following right behind it, um, obviously coag negative staph and enterococci two as well um, is a significant uh, uh, hospital acquired uh, a bug that we should uh, pay more attention to. It's currently I think the number three or number four uh, most common cause for uh, infective endocarditis. Um, but other things that we should think about would be fungal. These are going to be rare for, in, in immunocompromised patients and these HASIC organisms or these vestigious organisms that are very difficult to isolate in blood cultures. Um, so there's this entity of culture negative endocarditis, and this roughly makes up about 10% of the cases um, uh, of, of endocarditis that we're seeing. And most of the cases of culture negative endocarditis are gonna be because, because patients received antibiotics before they actually had a true evaluation for endocarditis. But this true culture negative endocarditis is, is due to the presence or due to the, these pathogens here or microorganisms here, such as Bartonella, Brucella, Coxiella, uh, mycoplasma, the, mycoplasma, the HASIC organisms. And these are, are, are very fastidious organisms. They're, again, they're very difficult to isolate and kind of your basis, basic um, infectious workup, i.e. blood cultures. And so you may have to do some serologic uh, testing um, if your index is a suspicion is high for endocarditis and you're just not getting anything um, from your infectious workup. So I include this slide here to show that basically, you know, depending on which region of the world you're in, the the the, uh, the frequency obviously of the micro or the pathogens that cause uh, endocarditis are will definitely vary. Here in North America, namely the U.S., we're seeing a lot uh, more infections due to uh, Staph aureus, and it's about equal uh, equal between Staph aureus and Strep species in Europe. However, kind of, you know, in, in South America, Sub-Saharan Africa, or these developing countries, we're still seeing a lot of streptococcal infections. And, and these, in, in these countries too, again, these uh, uh, number one cause or risk factor really for uh, of infectious endocarditis is also still rheumatic heart disease as well. Um, so I include this slide here. This is a study that was published in New England Journal of Medicine in 2020. And it really, uh, it looked at the incidence of, 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 of infective endocarditis. And I like this slide here because it shows the incidence according to age and also microorganism. And as we discussed, uh, we're seeing that it's you know, happening a lot more frequently in our older population. Um, it gives a great breakdown of kind of the typical microorganisms with staph aureus or staph species and streptococcal species roughly taking a, a large majority, roughly 80% of the, uh, uh, the infections that we're seeing. And again, this was another, I think, interesting slide too as well. It was a summary of kind of the worldwide microbiology of infective endocarditis. And this is really over the last five decades. Um, and uh, 
uh, uh, shows basically an increased frequency of staph aureus inf um, uh, of staph aureus infections. Okay, so again, the demography is changing, and uh, the uh, the microbiology is changing too as well. So, what are some risk factors? So, you know, valvular heart disease. Uh, uh, you know, patients with prostatic valves are obviously at high risk. Uh, uh, for uh, for infective endocarditis, patients with rheumatic heart disease, and again, this is you know mainly in the uh, developing countries. Uh, patients with implantable cardiac devices, uh, congenital heart disease. Of, of course, our patients who do IV drugs, um, untreated HIV infections, or anyone who really has extensive contact with the healthcare system, like our patients on dialysis, they're pretty much at risk for developing this uh, rare disease. So as far as the pathophysiology uh, uh, goes, the uh, the endocardial surface is uh, is is, uh, is a sterile environment. Uh, however, if there is destruction of the uh, the endothelial lining or the endoth end uh, end endothelial lining of the endocardial surface, uh, you basically what happens is that you expose the subendothelial matrix, and the subendothelial matrix really acts as like a scaffold essentially for bacteria to bind on. And these bacteria, of course, promote inflammatory cascades, promote uh, fibrin uh, production, platelet activation, and ultimately uh, they proliferate. You get the development of these vegetations along uh, on the valve, and destruction also of the uh, the endothelium and the valve too as well. Um, and then ultimately these 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 vegetations can disseminate and cause systemic illness and um, and embolic phenomena. Um, it's important to know this is not you know this all kind of happens simultaneously. Um, and, you know, this can happen really in the setting of, you know, degenerative bowel disease. If you use IV drugs, the solid particles in the drugs uh, can certainly damage the surfaces of the valve. So there's multiple ways that this, uh, this process can kind of uh, uh, start, but this is just a general overview of the, just of this, the path of physiology. Some of the signs and the uh, uh, symptoms uh, would be, you know, very nonspecific. So, so fever is going to be one of the uh, things that some patients uh, may typically have, or a new heart murmur, um, uh, or B symptoms such as malaise, weight loss, night sweats. Um, patients may have vascular phenomena, um, uh, particularly Janeway lesions, which are those painless lesions that your your uh, patients may have on their their palms and soles of their feet. Um, Immunologic phenomena such as Osler nose, which is the painful lesions at the tips of the fingers and toes, and raw spots, which are these microhemorrhages that can occur in the back of the eye if you do a good eye exam, and then you know things such as glomerular nephritis too as well. But mainly, it's going to be kind of these you know these you know patients, at least the patients that I've seen with infectious endocarditis, uh, have presented really with these kind of non-specific B, B symptoms. So it brings us to kind of you know how this is diagnosed and the criteria for diagnosis. So uh, this is the modified Duke criteria, um, and it's been used really since the mid '90s uh, uh, for uh, establishing a diagnosis of of, and of endocarditis. Uh, so here you have there's two portion, parts of the criteria. You have the major cri uh, clinical criteria and the minor clinical criteria. The major clinical criteria uh, would be you know if a patient has a positive blood culture. Um, and that's from positive culture with like a typical microorganisms that we previously talked about um, uh, that are known to cause uh, endocarditis. Um, positive, echo, uh, positive imaging or positive echocardiography. So if you see a vegetation on transthoracic or, or TEE, um, then that's, that meets a, a, a major cr uh, clinical criteria for endocarditis. Or in the presence really of a new murmur or, or a new valvular regurgitation too as well. Minor uh, clinical criteria would be uh, the presence of uh, predisposing cardiac conditions or uh, intravenous drug use, patients with fever, vascular phenomena, and, and immunologic phenomena. And there's some, uh, some infectious uh, 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 criteria too that can be met if um, you're not isolating organisms that are, that are, that are typical of, uh, of endocarditis. So ultimately to have a definite uh, diagnosis, you have to have either two major criteria, or you can have one major criteria, three minor criteria, or five minor criteria. And to have a possible diagnosis, that is that, hey, maybe you have a high index of suspicion for endocarditis, um, but you're just not, not, quite, not quite meeting all the, uh, the Duke's criteria to call it definite. You can have a, a combination of one major, one minor criteria, and three minor criteria. <clears throat> 
So these are really, really so imaging. So imaging is really a, 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 a big component or and in, in, in diagnosing um, endocarditis. And so really our, our go-to obviously is the transthoracic echo. And if that's negative or, uh, or, or even if it's positive, really the next step that uh, the guidelines tell you to do is to go to a transesophageal echo. Or if you're concerned that, you know, hey, you see an interesting lesion, um, say, in the aortic valve, and you're concerned for, you know, perforation or abscess or fistula development, TE would be indicated basically to look for that. Um, and also to look uh, if, if for patients who may have device-associated infections, too, as well. Um, TE would be indicated, okay? Uh, the updated valvular heart guidelines uh, and from 2020 also in, uh, included cardiac CT and FDG PET um, as well, um, too. These are class 2A recommendations. We'll go over that, uh, that what the guidelines, um, their algorithm for that. But really, cardiac CT can be used to kind of delineate the anatomy that you can't quite see well on, on TEE. For instance, if you have any paravalvular complications, such as um, not mycotic aneurysm, but abscesses or, or fistulas, they may be able to better be seen on, on cardiac CT. Um, and, and then, you know, cardiac CT also has, is, is, is prone to fewer uh, uh, artifacts from prosthetic valves too as well. So that may also help you with your imaging and, and surgical planning if you need to take these patients for surgery. Um, you can also get, a, 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 you know, a look at the coronaries too. So you can kind of get a two for one if you, if you need to take the patients for surgery with the cardiac CT. Uh, with FDG uh, uh, PET, again, uh, this was included in, to, in, in the, uh, the, 2020, the 2020 guidelines. Um, uh, uh, but this can also, if you have a, a, di a possible diagnosis of an endo uh, infective endocarditis and, or if you have like a, maybe a fistula or some paravalvular complication, but you just can't quite see, quite see uh, a vegetation on, on, on echo, you can use, uh, potentially use FDG pet to see if you can, uh, you know, better uh, uh, examine where the vegetation is and uh, um, establish a diagnosis, a definite diagnosis, okay? This is like an integrated uh, imaging strategy for patients with suspected uh, end endocarditis. And, uh, I, you know, this is from a review article in Jack that was published in 2017. I really kind of liked how they, they laid it out. Um, but, you know, let's see here. These are their guidelines basically for kind of the imaging um, for patients uh, who are at risk or with suspected native valve endocarditis or, or, or prosthetic valve endocarditis. Obviously, first we'll start with the T, TE and TEE. These are class one indications. Um, but it, again, you know, in 2020, they really added the cardiac CT um, if you're suspecting like particularly paravalvular abscesses. Um, or just like, you know, paravalvular complications, you can get a cardiac CT, um, or if you have a possible, uh, a case of possible infection of endocarditis by the Duke's criteria, then FDG uh, a PET may be helpful um, in trying to image uh, a vegetation. So as far as the complications go, of, of course, uh, you can have, you know, embolic phenomena, which we've touched on, and direct valvular uh, destruction, um, uh, uh, but, you know, you know, one thing that I learned from this talk is really the periannular or the kind of the paravalvular complications, and that's from periannular extension. So these are probably the most fear complications and will prompt kind of more urgent or, or uh, surgical um, intervention. They typically happen in about 10 to 40 percent of cases. Um, so first with abscesses. Uh, 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 so abscesses can, occur, of course, occur around uh, valves, particularly mitral valve and aortic valve. With aortic valve, for instance, they, the abscesses typically like to occur at the weakest portion of the annulus, which is that the area between the membranous septum and also the AV node. Um, and so uh, if that abscess grows, uh, there, you know, there's an integral relationship between the aortic uh, a valve and the, the, uh, the uh, bundle of hiss. And so if that abscess grows, it, compress, it can compress some of those conduction fibers um, and cause uh, first degree AV block or complete heart block. So patients may present, this may be their first presenting uh, uh, signs or symptom of, it, of endocarditis would be you know, complete heart block due, due to a uh, you know, paravalvular abscess. You can have fistula formation, which can really occur uh, within any chamber. Uh, some more interesting ones would be like an aorto RA fistula, which creates like a left to right shunt. Obviously, patients can present in heart failure or aorto, aorto LA fistula, which can, you know, patients will may have like refractory pulmonary edema and heart failure um, that will require a surgical intervention. And then, uh, you know, things such as like a hemorrhagic pericardial effusion. 
Um, so in the proximal aorta, the, it's a portion of the proximal aorta that's surrounded by kind of pericard pericardial tissue. And so if you have an abscess there that kind of ruptures through um, to that space, you can get uh, the, the, uh, the formation of this hemorrhagic uh, pericardial effusion. So again, these are very deadly uh, 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 complications. And typically, if you're seeing any of these, you're, taking, you're going to be taking the patient to surgery. So courtesy of Dr. Fellner, um, uh, he, uh, thank you for providing uh, some of these images. So this is a patient with a very huge tricuspid valve uh, 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 vegetation. Uh, we see it, so I'm gonna loop the video for you all. Um, this is the transthoracic uh, echo here and the TE images um, to go along with it. So next we have a example here of a orto RA fistula. This is a TEE. You have the uh, A order here, and then you have the RA RV here, and you see there's a fistula, a nice, beautiful kind of color Doppler, um, which you know the A order and the RA are essentially communicating through the fistula here. Hopefully this patient got surgery. And then, you know, I said I included one of the pulmonary, pulmonary valves because I feel like it's always forgotten, but these are just kind of interesting uh, images um, that Dr. Fellner was able to provide for me. So, you know, with, you know, so now we talked about basically, you know, these clinical manifestations, particularly the uh, paravalvular complications. What about the role of a surgical intervention for the management of effective endocarditis? Uh, so generally the purpose of surgery is uh, basically to remove any infected tissue, form, material, or hardware, um, uh, remove any threatening sources of embolism, to clear and to bribe paravalvular infection, and ultimately to restore cardiac integrity and, and, and valve function. Um, that being said, surgery is generally performed in about 50 to 60% of the patients with native valve endocarditis. Um, the six-month survival rates are actually greater than um, 80%, so they're pretty good. However, you know, in some studies have shown that the 10 month, 10 month survival rates are actually between 40 and 60%. Um, and, you know, not quite sure why, you know, the survival rates aren't quite as great as the six months, the long-term survival rates aren't quite great. Uh, you know, this potentially could be due to just infections of the, of the uh, bioprosthetic or the, or the, the valve re uh, replacement, um, uh, residual infection that could, uh, like from the biofilms that can take place around basically the area, the surface of the heart or any like systemic complications that, um, that were acquired kind of prior to surgery may be kind of contributing to these higher survival rates after, after surgery. And then the typical indications are going to be, you know, patients with really refractory, refractory heart failure, uh, like, you know, refractory pulmonary edema, cardiogenic shock from like a fistula or, you know, that is causing a shunt or a significant aortic valve or mitral valve regurgitation that's causing a significant hemodynamic compromise. Any uncontrolled infections from like a, you know, patient with persistently positive blood cultures or, again, those paravalvular um, uh, complications or multi-drug or fungal pathogens, you're typically going to want to take these patients to surgery uh, pretty early. And then also to prevent uh, 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 systemic embolism, and particularly if patients have aortic or mitral valve vegetation that's large, and they also have presence of more than one embolic event already, then it's appropriate really to take, to take them to surgeon, surgery uh, um, um, early. So, I like this table too. This was also from a review article in Jack, um, but it basically kind of outlines the indications of uh, for surgery. Um, uh, and they, uh, with the uh, AHA and also e, uh, ESC guidelines. So one thing, I, the big thing I want to kind of point out, uh, yes, I know these are 2015 guidelines, but not much has really changed from, you know, 2014, 2015 to like 2020 with these, with these guidelines. I like the way this was organized, so I kept it. Um, but one of the things I wanted to point out was essentially with timing. Um, so the AHA guidelines, early surgery basically just means that surgeries uh, just, or just need to happen during the initial, initial hospitalization before the, com the completion of full course antibiotics. But what I like about the European guidelines is that they actually provide a little bit more definitive um, recommendation on the timing for surgery. So they divide it for, uh, between emergent, urgent, um, and uh, ele uh, obviously elective. Emergent would be within 24 hours. Urgent would be within like, say, you know, two to four days. Um, and an elective could be within like one to two weeks. Okay. And uh, the guidelines, uh, again, you know, 
I like the way this table is divided into like the, the different indications. One basically be, you know, being for refractory heart failure. Um, if it's if a patient has you know any significant valvular destruction, native valve destruction, or 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 one of those paravalvular complications or prostatic valve complications, it's a class one um, indication to take them um, to surgery. Um, for any uncontrolled infections, uh, which we kind of already highlighted, it's a class one, mainly a class one B indication to really take these patients for early surgery based on the AHA guidelines. And if they have relapsing prosthetic valve infection, uh, endocarditis, then it's a class two uh, indication. And then for the prevention of uh, embolism too, as well, it's reasonable also to take patients uh, for surgery early to prevent uh, you know, further systemic disease. So this was a, uh, a, a study um, that really looked at the, uh, the association between kind of surgical indications, operative risk, and clinical outcomes in the effect of endocarditis. And they used a pretty large cohort, the ICE, International Collaboration of Endocarditis. Um, this was a, uh, a prospective cohort uh, of, of, of patients with definite infective endocarditis. They had about 1,300 patients with left-sided native valve endocarditis. And of the 1,300 patients they included, 57% uh, uh, um, underwent surgery. Now, the 57%, 70%, percent of the patients actually had a surgical indication. Um, and some of the interesting things that they, they, they had in this, this uh, they kind of outlined in, the, in this particular paper were for reasons for not taking patients for a surgical treatment, um, included patients who had a poor prognosis. Um, and these are patients who, who did not go to surgery, who needed surgery. These are patients who, uh, they, you know, the reasons why they didn't were poor prognosis. They were, you know, too hemodynamically unstable. They either died before surgery or had a stroke or had really severe sepsis. Um, among patients with a surgical indication, um, they found that surgical treatment was independently associated with patients with severe aortic regurgitation, or if they had some of those paravalvular complications, such as abscess, an abscess, um, if they had embolization prior to surgical treatment, or if they were transferred to the hospital for surgery, they were generally, it was generally independently associated with actually having surgery if it was indicated. And then, you know, variables that are associated with non-surgical treatment were patients with really significant uh, moderate liver, uh, severe liver disease, if they had a stroke, unfortunately, prior to surgical decision, uh, and remarkably, if they had staph or, or ASC etiology too, as well. Another thing I thought was interesting in this particular paper is that the surgical, preoperative surgical risk actually almost actually served, served in like kind of helping kind of with uh, post-operative uh, kind of prognosis for these particular, um, particular patients. So here we have a graph with survival time and days and survival probability, and they kind of stratify it based on patients um, with whether or not they had an indication for surgery. Uh, what their preoperative surgical risk was and whether or not they actually went to surgery. And what we can see with patients who had a surgical indi uh, indication, uh, low surgical uh, or STS score, and who went to surgery, they actually did quite well. Um, and, uh, you know, patients who didn't have any surgery or uh, indications, didn't go to surgery, also did, you know, pretty well as, as well. But what we see here is that, you know, these patients uh, who had a sur clear surgical indication high preoperative risk, but didn't get the surgery. We saw obviously their, their survival probability is poor. So early surgery works. This was another surgery for, uh, you know, it was a randomized control trial in 2012, I believe, and then, uh, that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, it was uh, early surgery for versus conventional uh, treatment uh, uh, for infective endocarditis. Um, and they basically, it was a randomized control trial, had about 76 patients. They basically, uh, you know, saw, they asked the question whether, you know, patients with left-sided native valve endocarditis who are at high risk for cardioembolic events, uh, and they uh, does early surgery within 48 hours or reduce the mortality in embolic events as compared to conventional management. And conventional management here was just, you know, giving a patient antibiotics, and if they eventually needed surgery, then they, they would do it for them, but it wasn't within the 48-hour period. So they included patients, of course, with left-sided native valve endocarditis. They had to have large vegetations, um, you know, uh, and also severe mitral valve and, or, or aortic valve disease. And their primary endpoint was a composite in-hospital death um, or cardioembolic events within the first six weeks. And uh, secondary endpoint was a composite of death, embolic events, recurrence of and endocarditis, and repeat hospitalizations due to development of heart failure. So what they uh, what they saw was that with uh, with early surgery um, versus conventional surgery, essentially there was a, a decrease in the primary endpoint or probability of death here, and this was largely driven by the decrease um, in, 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 in embolic events. Okay. 
And then as far as the secondary endpoint go, again, it's a composite of death, recurrent infection of endocarditis, recurrent uh, em uh, embolic events. Again, what they saw was a, uh, was a, uh, a or ultimately, ultimately, it was better to take patients basically to surgery early when compared to uh, com compared to uh, conventional treatment. Okay, and again, this was largely driven by uh, the reduction in cardioembolic events too, as well. So we talked about kind of the role, you know the role of surgical intervention, um, and uh, so we'll I guess we'll explore the incidence of uh, infective endocarditis following prosthetic valve replacement. Um, and so, uh, the, generally, prosthetic valve endocarditis accounts for roughly 20% of the cases that we're seeing of, of infective endocarditis, and you can classify it in two types. Early prosthetic valve uh, endocarditis is acquired with, within one year of the procedure, um, um, and it's usually secondary to kind of intraoperative contamination or, uh, uh, or, or hematogenous spread um, of the infection to the, uh, the uh, prosthetic valve. Um, and then late post, uh, prosthetic valve endocarditis um, is acquired kind of following one year um, and occurs really secondary to kind of community acquired infections. So, you know, I'm really focused really on aortic valve uh, uh, replacements here, because as, as, as we know, we're doing a lot more over the last decade, a lot more uh, 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 aortic valve replacements and particularly a lot more TAVRs. Um, and I think it's important to kind of understand uh, the incidence and, and, and the uh, mortality that's associated with, with uh, endocarditis if, if our patients um, unfortunately end up having it. So this was a, uh, a, a, a study pu published in circulation in 2019. Um, and essentially uh, it was, it actually used uh, the data from the partners one and partners two trial. And it basically uh, kind of looked at really the incidence and and the complications basically uh, associated with uh, aortic valve replacement, particularly looking at you know SAVR versus TAVR. Um, and this particular uh, 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 graph showed that there was essentially no change really in the incidence uh, of, of infective endocarditis uh, between patients who received TAVR for aortic valve replacement or SAVR. Okay. And what they did see is that patients who did end up having a prosthetic valve endocarditis, or in the, uh, they had a pretty much 96.2% per, um, of them had, you know, uh, they died essentially. So there was a high mortality associated with uh, endocarditis um, uh, following a um, aortic valve replacement. Okay. And this is, this includes patients with TAVR and SAVR. And for patients who got TAVR and SAVR and no prosthetic valve uh, endocarditis, this is obviously their mortality uh, is a lot, a lot lower. Uh, and so this is another study that was really a like kind of like, pooled several different uh, uh, trials uh, uh, together, and it looked at uh, kind of the same thing that the previous trial looked at, kind of the incidence of endocarditis and um, and the mortality. And and what we see here, this is the the SAVR, and this is patients with uh, uh, with TAVR two. Again, this is uh, we see that the incidence was roughly at one year is zero point six percent for patients who received a SAVR. Um, uh, and this is and at one year for patients with TAVR is 0.2%. At five years, it was 1.58 and 1% respectively. So still relatively rare. Um, however, with the mortality that they saw, uh, again, they still saw significant mortality, particularly in patients who received SAVR versus TAVR. But again, the rates of mortality were still generally pretty high, indicating that if pa once these patients get the valve replacement, um, and if they do have a complication such as endocarditis, um, then it can be pretty deadly. Some studies have tried to kind of uh, find, uh, 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 you know, characteristics that may predispose patients or maybe so independently associated with the development of uh, prosthetic valve endo endocarditis. Uh, in this particular study, I sought to do that. It looked at patients, you know, without endocarditis and with endocarditis. And ultimately, ultimately, this was a, a much sicker population. What they saw that uh, significantly patients had uh, you know, more uh, PAD, they had more uh, CO, more higher incidence of COPD, and, 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 and there was a higher incidence of patients on, the, uh, on, on dialysis too as well. Okay. So this is another Fellner special. Um, this was a vegetation really seen here on a, uh, a TAVR patient. 
So lastly, we'll, we'll briefly talk about the, uh, the guidelines for prevention of, of infective endocarditis. Uh, uh, so with, with prophylaxis, again, in 2007, the AHA and ESC really changed their guidelines on who should receive uh, antibiotic prophylaxis. Prior to that, uh, like 10 years prior to that in 1997, essentially what they did was kind of stratify kind of patients uh, based on kind of underlying cardiac disease. They had these high-risk patients, which are really here in this uh, in the updated recommendation. They had like moderate-risk patients, such as patients with mitral valve, like prolapse and MR, um, or, uh, you know, a, a ventricular septal defects or, or hokum. And then you had kind of had these patients with very, uh, very low risk. Um, and essentially, we were kind of you know, prophylacting almost everyone. Uh, um, and we were doing it for dental procedures, for, uh, for GI procedures, uh, GU procedures. Um, in 2007, again, there was really no significant, there was no good data that really supported really the use of, 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 of uh, prophylactic antibiotics. So basically kind of limited to a very, a very specific high risk uh, population and only limited uh, during, due, to, uh, due to patients undergoing like high risk dental procedures or procedures that involve uh, manipulation of gingival tissue. Um, and so these, this high, group, uh, high risk group of patients that you all should keep in um, the back of your head uh, would be patients with prosthetic cardiac valves. And these are patients who have gotten like TAVRs um, or, or patients with prosthetic material used for cardiac valve repair, such as annuoplasty rings, cords, or clips, which we should, we should uh, definitely prophylax these patients. If they've had a history of, of, of infective endocarditis, we should, we should as well. Um, uh, any unrepaired cyanotic congenital heart disease or repaired congenital heart disease with residual shunts and val valvular regurgitation, and we should also uh, uh, prophylact these patients. And lastly, it uh, would be patients who uh, uh, underwent a, a cardiac transplant uh, uh, and now have like a, a, a structurally abnormal valve, then we should also uh, consider uh, prophylaxing these patients. This is a class 2A recommendation too as well. And this is based off the updated 2020 uh, guideline, valvular heart, uh, and valvular heart disease guidelines too, as well. So, you know, so the, the big take home points are that, you know, with infective endocarditis uh, is uh, really the native disease uh, or native valve or the prosthetic valve is rare, but it's really associated with high morbidity and mortality. Um, and that's probably mainly due to a systemic complications. Um, the diagnosis really he relies heavily on cardiac imaging and, and I think, uh, although I haven't seen it done much, we should, I think we should, you know, certainly start using, uh, utilizing uh, cardiac CT and, and PET uh, to aid in our, uh, the diagnosis uh, 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 for, of endocarditis. Um, and, uh, you know, surgery is indicated. We talked about the indications for surgery, really for refractory heart failure, uh, uncontrolled infection, um, or for, for, for the prevention of uh, embolism. And again, antibiotics are reserved for those high-risk group individuals that we just reviewed um, who are undergoing major dental procedures. We have everyone else, no need for it. All right. And that is it. So, I, you know, before, you know, before I end my presentation, as an update on the patient, ultimately, I think he, he had a pretty uh, a significant hospital course. So uh, uh, he was intubated uh, for MSSA uh, pneumonia, which I thought was the source for this. Um, he got chest tube place. He had a, a, had a, a cardiac tamponade. Um, and he's had to get a drain in place, and, and he survived all that. And now he's on the gym med floor, and they're actually trying to get him to SAR. They flirted with the idea of surgery. Um, however, he was just too sick and and and, and too deconditioned at this point. And so CT surgery is still following him right now. But I don't think there are any plans for surgery in the near future um, to to deal with that questionable uh, right atrial mass and, and mitral valve vegetation. All right, any questions? Chris, <clears throat> uh, very good review. Actually, I have a quick comment and then a, and then a question. Um, my comment is one that just uh, uh, from, from some experience dealing with these patients, just you know, something for the fellows out there. When you have a patient with prosthetic aortic valve endocarditis, um, be, ext be extremely um, on the lookout for perivalvular involvement. Um, I can just tell you, in my experience, if anything even looks at all funny in the perivalvular tissue uh, for a patient with, really, it's not just particularly prosthetic, but even with native valve aortic endocarditis, uh, 
um, have a very high index of suspicion for perivabular involvement, abscesses, et cetera. I cannot tell you how many times that we've sent someone and to the to the OR and the surgeon came back and said, or it's, I guess it's happened a handful of times. The surgeon's like, you know, there was an abscess around that valve and went back and looked and there was a little bit of thickening and nothing like no obvious, you know, fluid collections or uh, no obvious abscess by imaging. Um, but, but in retrospect, a little bit of thickening, a little bit. So like I said, it's been my experience if there's any ab abnormal looking thickening around the, the either the prosthetic or the native aortic valve, it probably means there's an abscess there. Um, uh, and then my question would be, you sort of made two key points. One is, you know, and the data clearly shows that early intervention is better for these patients, et cetera. But the other key point you made is, particularly in this country, that it's an aging population that's getting infective endocarditis with, with multiple comorbidities, you know, frank, you know, frequently uh, malignancy, et cetera, uh, you know, renal failure and on and on. Um, so it's been my clinical experience that, that despite the fact that we know that early intervention is useful, it doesn't always happen because of the second point is that these are frequently very sick patients with a lot of comorbidities. Um, so I, I, I don't know, I guess it, I'm, not, I'm not even sure what my question is. How, how can you, um, uh, you know, based on what you've reviewed, uh, try to, try to um, uh, I don't know, try to live with those two sort of contradictory points? Yeah, I mean, it's difficult because the data, honestly, it's kind of all over the place, basically, for a surgical, surgical intervention. Some trials show that, obviously, the, a couple of trials that have shown that, you know, it's been really, you know, beneficial and, um, and, uh, and, and in other trials, not so much. Uh, I think at the end of the day, it's going to be kind of, I think we need to go back really to patient-centered care and kind of keep the patient in focus. This is like an older person who who has like metastatic cancer or like some significant renal disease and 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 they have now have endocarditis that's causing significant uh, valvular vegetation, you know, or, or, you know, hemodynamic compromise, then um, this is probably not going to be someone I'm taking, you know, taking the surgery. I'm going to be pushing more so goals of care. Um, however, uh, you know, if this is a, a young patient like my patient is 57 years old. Um, although he does have a lot of risk factors uh, and, and a lot of medical comorbidities, then, you know, based on the data that I've seen, which, you know, the, particularly the two trials I presented, then, you know, I'll be you know, more, more pushed really to try to, you know, get this, get this gentleman into surgery. But at the end of the day, really, it's, it's from what I've read, again, all the, even though there's a lot of strong data for early surgery, I think there's it's still there's really there's not a lot there's not been a lot of randomized controlled trials to kind of uh, uh, kind of dictate kind of again the timing or kind of who do we take um, as well um, if that makes any sense. Hopefully, I answer your question. Yeah, no, I agree, I, and I don't think we have great real world quote unquote data on these yeah. patients. You know, dialysis patients, like you said, patients with metastatic. Uh, you know, malignancies, things of this nature. A lot frequently, those patients don't get enrolled in these endocarditis these trials. Yeah, trials, and that, you know, in the real world, that's that's often who we're finding with endocarditis. And then, what do you do with these patients? You know, who have yeah. possibly shortened life expectancy anyway, et cetera. So, um, question from the audience from Dr. Sommerfeld: Cardiac CT should be done if there is concern for perivalvular abscess in aortic. Uh, endocarditis. Far, yes, I would. That a good point. Uh, I would agree with that. Um, that um, you know whether it becomes standard of care or just very very low threshold for doing uh, this test in a patient with with you know aortic valve or I guess really any sort of prosthetic valve endocarditis, um, looking for perivalvular involvement because um, Dr. Summerfeld's right. Uh, CT is way better than echo. Um, at, at detecting potentially this perivabular uh, involvement. So particularly with prosthetic valves, as he mentioned in his comments, so. Other questions from the audience? Hey, Robbie, Chris. Hey. How are you doing? So that was very good. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the things we have to force ourselves to do is always think of endocarditis. So, uh, and then we have to think about what we tell our patients. For example, if you have someone with a prosthetic valve, it's good to tell them that uh, if they ever have any fever before they take 
a ZPAC, they need to have some blood cultures because of the fear that they might have endocarditis. And uh, I will say that we're all a bit confused about endocarditis prophylaxis. You know, the guidelines uh, skip things like mitral stenosis and bicuspid aortic valve. I remember when Bill Roberts was here talking about aortic stenosis and uh, someone asked him the question about bicuspid aortic valve and said, you know, Dr. Roberts, do you, uh, what do you think about the guidelines not recommending endocarditis prophylaxis for someone with a bicuspid valve? And he said, he says, what? He says, that's crazy. <laughs> as, as you might think that, that he would have a comment like that, which, uh, and then there are patients coming in the office for years and years and years who've taken endocarditis prophylaxis for their mitral valve disease or their bicuspid aortic valve. And suddenly we tell them they're not indicated anymore and uh, always makes me feel a little uneasy. You know, anytime we have one of our patients who gets endocarditis, any of us, um, it always makes me feel uncomfortable because I feel like I've not totally done my job right and trying to, trying to prevent endocarditis. So I, I was interested in the TAVR data there. It doesn't seem to me that we have endocarditis on a TAVR very often, like through our echo lab. Robbie, would you agree with that? Um, we rarely see, you know, if we've done 5,000 now, we rarely see endocarditis on a TAVR valve. Yeah, I, we, uh, I, I, we, rarely, but we've seen it. We've seen it, but you're right. I, I would just feels like it's maybe le a little bit less than your- I also your have the feeling that, valve. that the freestyle valve may have less endocarditis than the uh, just regular Carpentier Edwards porcine uh, prosthesis. So uh, that was very good. You know, when you say, how do you diagnose endocarditis? Well, like Dr. Hirsch used to say, if they have a murmur and they have fever, then they have endocarditis until proven otherwise. Of course, now we have ways to look at their valves in detail and can quickly make an assessment of that. But there were days before there was echo and fever and murmur equals endocarditis and you have to treat them for it. So that was very good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just say just a quick, I, I have a currently have a young patient of mine with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy who's at outside hospital awaiting transfer with HASIC endocarditis, native mitral valve endocarditis with a HASIC organism. He's 20 something years old. So, mm -hmm. you know, look, I, you know, I've had a handful of these patients who get endocarditis through the years. Not, you know, I don't know what's more damaging given all these patients antibiotics every time they go to the dentist and breeding resistance or, you know, the, whatever, these pretty um, unfortunate cases that, that come up from time to time. Uh, so, right, it's obviously, it's, it's a tough one. I, I'm of the mindset of a patient with a bicuspid valve or whatever, hypertrophic, car, they really want to do antibiotic prophylaxis. I don't, I don't, give it to them. yeah, I give it to them. I, you know, I, I sort of tell them it's technically not indicated, but if, if they've been doing it all their lives or really just want to do it, then I, uh, I, I will prescribe the antibiotic. So that's been my approach. Okay. Well, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, that's, that's it. Yeah, good. I was make sure I didn't want to cut anyone off. If no more questions from the group, I thank everyone for tuning in today. Thank you, Chris, for excellent review. And uh, uh, we will see everybody next Friday. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.